all week long, this thought has been laid on my mind, and I realize today why. And I want to talk to you tonight on, on, a, on a subject. I, I've preached on this before, not here, but on the thought that there's a devil loose. How many realize that? There is a real, literal devil. A lot of people call him the booger man. Some folks call him Satan. Some call him Lucifer. Some call him the devil. But let me, under, let me help you understand that there is a devil loose, and he is out to kill, steal, and to destroy. Now, that's not my thoughts. That's the words of Christ. He said that Satan has come that he might steal, kill, and to destroy. But what did he say? I have come that you might have life and abundantly not just a little life, but an abundant life. And if you are at 1 Peter chapter 5, if you would stand with me, I want us to read just a few verses of Scripture, starting in verse number 5. I'm sorry, verse number 6. Peter said, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Now notice this. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, your enemy, the devourer, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of our grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that ye have suffered a while, make ye perfect, establish, strengthen, settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Would you lift your hands this way and let's pray together. Father, tonight we thank you so much for this time that we've gathered in this place. We thank you, O oh God, for the anointing of the Holy Spirit that we feel that is right here in this room. We thank you for your presence that is here from God, the very first word go this morning until right now. We ask, O oh God, nothing short of your divine will to be done in this place tonight. God, that we might be totally aware that there is a devil loose, but more importantly, there is a God in heaven who has dispatched the anointing of the Holy Holy Ghost to come down to this world to defeat the devourer, to destroy the devil, to give to victory to your children, to all those who are called by your name. And Father, we will give you all the praise and the glory for everything that is done. For it's in the mighty name of Jesus the Christ that we pray. Amen and amen. Now can somebody give God some praise and some glory in this place tonight that he might be lifted up that he might be glorified, that he might be magnified. And you may be seated together. As we look around this world, we understand that, yes, indeed, there is a devil loose. From the very moment of time that he was kicked out of heaven, he has been on this earth roaming, seeking whom he may devour. We read over in the book of Job, chapters 1 and 2, where the sons of God come before God, and the devil, it says, Satan also came with them. And God asked him, where have you come from? And Satan said, from the world. Well, let's just read it. What it says, I don't want to get it wrong. Chapter 1, verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, From whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Can you understand that the, the devil is out there seeking whom he may devour? And he is seeking after you. Why? Why is he seeking after you? Because he is seeking after those who are servants and followers of God. He is seeking after those who are doing the will of God. He is doing, he is seeking after those that, that, that as, as Pastor Stadium was talking this morning, that praise. You know, if you get down to pray, have you noticed it? Everything will start coming into your mind. The phone will start ringing. 
Somebody will come to the door. The children will start calling you. Something will happen to try to take the place of what you are doing, and that is talking and communing with God. That's why it is so important. That's why the Scripture tells us to steal away into our prayer closet. Get into a place where, where no distractions can bother you. It wouldn't hurt one thing. Now, I know teenagers just cannot understand this, but it would not hurt one thing to turn the cell phone off. It wouldn't hurt one thing to take the phone off the hook. It wouldn't hurt anything if somebody knocked on the door. They can wait. I haven't found yet anything that someone knocked on my door when I was praying that couldn't wait. But you see, sometimes your prayer may not need to wait. We need to call upon the name of the Lord. We need to get away and steal away with him and, and talk to him. That's why the devil, the enemy, your adversary, is so vigilant trying to devour and to destroy you. Think about some lion that's going through the, the, the jungles. And, and he, all he's doing, he's just walking around all the time seeking food. Just walking around seeking something that he can attack and pounce upon and, 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 and eat that prey and eat that, that, that thing and just devour it and just destroy it and get rid of it. Satan understands and realizes that a praying Christian is one of the most dangerous things on planet Earth. Why? Because God hears the prayers of the saints. God hears the prayers that you pray and call upon him. You know, sometimes you feel like he's not listening. Sometimes you feel like he's not there. Sometimes you think, well, why, what good does it do because my prayer is going unanswered? And Pastor Statham did very well this morning on explaining that. Sometimes it may be God is saying, let's just see how, how per persistent you can be. Do you really want what you're asking for? Do you really want what you're praying for? Do you really want what you're seeking after? Can I tell you the devil wants to do everything he can to stop you because your prayer could change the life of somebody else. Your life can change the life of somebody else. As I believe it was Danielle this morning was talking about, sometimes it's just the way people see you. They see the anointing on you. You don't have to tell them. You don't have to say, hey, I'm a Christian. They look at your life and see the fruit that's in your life. I talked a few weeks ago about the, the, the need of the power, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And Brother Christian came along last Sunday, night, last Sunday morning and talked about that. We need, the church needs the power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because we are truly living in the last days. We're living in the time that the devil is doing everything he can to destroy the work of the church. Had a little sign in my office one time that said the church is so busy doing church work that it gets lost sight of the work of the church. Now that might have to sink in just a little bit. Sometimes we get so busy with church work that we lose sight of the work of the church. The work of the church is winning the lost and making disciples. But sometimes we get so busy with the other little things that we want it to be that we forget about the lost. That we forget about that soul that's out there on the street. We forget about that one that does not know Christ that, that, that is standing there that we come across in contact with every day. You see, the adversary, the devil, may have them in the very grip of his clutches. And he may be choking the very lifeblood out of them. And it may very well be that your life is going to be the one, but he's going to come along. He's going to tell you something like, well, maybe you just need to go on the other side of the street. Pastor Slater made a statement this morning that man just rings so true in churches, how we can kill somebody without ever pulling the trigger of a gun. And you know, and he made this statement how that when you pull the trigger and you actually kill someone, that they die, and you can come to the altar and you can repent and if you mean it and God will forgive you and you can live in heaven forever but do you realize that person that you shot and killed is remain, remains dead? They, they, they no longer have life in their body. They no longer exist. Do you realize that the very words of our lips that we crucify and kill someone in, in, the, in the spirit can also be killed in that other individual's life as well forever? You may speak evil about this person or that person just because you don't like the way they look, because you don't like the way they smell, because you don't like the way they act. I shared with you one time, I had a bunch of church folk one time, we, we had some little kids coming to church and they didn't like the way they smelled. 
They just wasn't exactly, they didn't look like us. And I'm telling you, instantly a, a, a fruitful, productive ministry died in its tracks. Why? Simply because they allowed the enemy, the adversary, the devil, the roaring lion to come in and devour what God was trying to do. Can I tell you, church, we need to be very aware. We need to be very in tune. We need to be very, have our eyes open to realize that the enemy is out to devour and to destroy us. Don't look at your neighbor and say, well, he's after you. He's not, he's not going to be after me. Honey, he's after everybody. He, it, it, especially if you're trying to do right. Especially if you're trying to serve God, you know, you can get saved on a Sunday morning and you can start living right. It's like, it's like all hell going to break loose on Monday. You know, I, I, I get kind of aggravated at some of these preachers that says, okay, you're going to get saved and everything's going to be all right. And, you know, and, 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 and we, we kind of lend towards teaching folks that thinking because we'll, we'll sing songs like if it keeps getting better and better, oh Lord, I don't know what I'm going to do. We understand that through the trials, through the struggles, through the tribulations, through the, through the, through the junk, that it can get better because God is with us even though outward appearance may say everything's going downhill. But we can understand and know that when we have God on the inside of us, it doesn't matter how much the adversary comes. Because you see, in Job, when God was asking Satan, where have you come from? He went on and said, have you considered my servant Job? See, God was, was, was so pleased with Job because Job, the scripture says, was a perfect man and upright in God's sight. Can I tell you something? Let me put a little ad note here. Don't worry about other people's sight. Concern yourself within God's sight. Concern yourself within God's sight. Don't worry about what, what Billy Bob or, or Sue, Sue Joe thinks about you. Say, God, what would you have me to do? There, there was a time in my life not very long ago that, that I was making some decisions and different folks said, well, what's folks going to think about this? What's, I said, you know what? It don't really matter to me what people say, what people think, as long as what God knows. What God knows. You see, I, I saw a sign a few, few years back, big old billboard. I think some church put it up. It says, your reputation is what man thinks of you. Your character is what God thinks of you. Because, you see, your reputation can be good in church. Whew. Did you feel that? Get outside and slap the wife. Why didn't you sit closer to me in church? People are going to think we're having problems. <laughs> Sound like I got problems. But when you're at home and alone and, and you're intimate with God and nobody's looking, nobody's seeing, and you're, you're just riding down the road by yourself and you're just tuning in with God and nobody's, nobody's around to see that's what's building your character so that when you do get in church and the spirit of God begins to move yes you can feel the Holy Ghost jerk you can feel the nudge of the spirit you can allow a tear to come down your face yes it's alright you see sometimes when the spirit moves you just liable to cry your eyes out like a big old baby sometimes when the Holy Spirit hits you you may laugh like a hyena you may fall on the floor and just lay there you see, you, you can't predict what God's going to do. He'll mess you up. Don't ever tell him, God, I won't do this. He'll show you. He'll show you what you will and won't do. Because you see, a lot of times he's going to say, let's just see how willing you are to obey me. To obey. I like what Pastor Christian was telling me this morning. It's obedience and unity. We want the spirit to move. Let's be obedient. What, what, what did Saul of Tarsus do? He was an evil, vile, wretched man. He, he thought he was doing religious stuff. See, he was doing the church work. Thought he was doing the work of the church, but all he was doing was church work. He was doing the religious stuff. You know, there's a lot of folks that's very religious. They'll drink religiously. Every Friday night, they get plastered. I, I work with some of them. They talk about how religious they are. Yeah, they go to church on Sunday, but on Friday, all they're talking about is, I can't wait to get off and drink me some beer. Okay. Religion can send you to hell. 
Christianity, what is Christianity? Christianity simply means Christ-like or like Christ. Now, how Christ-like is it for us to come in here and worry about how long the preacher's preaching? How Christ-like is it for us to come in here and look across the way and say, what are they doing here? Who do they think they are? Well, this is the house of God. And they have come in evidently to receive from God. I hope you didn't come in tonight to see how good I look because you're going to be so disappointed. Or how well-dressed somebody is or what somebody has on or because you've got a new automobile and I just got to drive it and show it off. You've received your glory. We need to come into this place as the praise team was singing to magnify God, to glorify him, to lift him up. You don't have to be running the aisles all the time. Don't take me wrong. You, th th there is times just simply standing in one spot, the anointing of God can come upon you, tears stream down your face, and you might not open your mouth and utter a sound, but the anointing and the power of God could be all over you. I can remember so many times as a little boy sitting on the, the third row of the church on the end, laying down my head in my papa's lap and my feet in my granny's lap. I remember so many times being thrown out in the floor because when the Holy Ghost would hit my papa, he, he'd just start doing that. I mean, that, uh, he'd just start doing that. I don't know how many times I was thrown in the floor. I can remember one time as his pastor, he was standing in my altar. I had called for the church workers to come and, uh, and, and he didn't understand what I'd said and he came up there and, and we prayed for everybody, and I got to Papa, and we prayed for him. And I'm telling you, all of a sudden, all he did, he was standing there, and he had one hand raised. And he started that, the Holy Ghost shake on him. And I had to stand there and hold him up while the Holy Ghost come up. 80-something years old, standing there, and the anointing still coming on him. Can I tell you, you don't have to be running out. But now sometimes you better get your running shoes on. Because the Holy Ghost can hit you and you'll be running, you'll be flying, you'll be, you'll be doing circles and somersaults, who knows. But the reason we need him is because there's that other booger, your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And why is it that he always throws that thing at you that bothers you the most? Because you let him know how bad it bothers you. As one little girl went to her granny and says, Granny, it just don't appear to you like the devil bothers you. She says, oh, honey, he does. He bothers me every day. She says, well, what is it that he bothers with at you that gets you the most? She says, I ain't telling you. She says, well, why, Granny, I need to know. She says, honey, if I tell you, he'll hear it, and that's what he'll use. Tell God. Well, how am I going to tell God with, without the devil hearing it? Have you heard of praying in an unknown tongue? You see, that's one of the reasons, and I think I touched on this a couple weeks ago. That's why it's so important that we have the Holy Spirit living deep inside of us because when we start praying in tongues, it blows his mind. He has no earthly idea what you're praying. He don't know what you're saying. It drives him crazy. And he sends all the demons and the devils. He can't go up there and bug them, find out what's wrong with them, and get them to stop praying. You wonder why you have such fits? It's because your adversary, the devil, there's a devil loose. He don't have no red horns on his head, no red suit, no pointed tail and a pitchfork. He'll come at you as an angel of light. Scripture tells us he was the most beautiful creation, created angel God had. He was the, he was the minister of music in heaven. He, he, he had him made. But then all of a sudden, what was it he said? I will exalt myself. God tolerated that for about, what, three times, Pastor? And on that God says, that's enough. You're gone. God won't put up with it very long. There's a devil loose. We, God's people, need to understand he's out to get you. He's out to steal, 
kill, and to destroy. It, it was so, Jesus was so concerned about it. Go with me to the book of Luke. The book of Luke, chapter 22. I love this. I love this verse. Luke chapter 22, verse 31. I guess I need to tell you that too. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon. Why did he call his name twice? Was Simon hard of hearing? No, he wanted to have his attention. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. Christ wanted Peter to understand it's coming. Be prepared. I believe he's telling us tonight he's out there. He's searching. He's looking for you. Be prepared. But notice, aren't you glad that following verse 31 comes verse 32? But I have prayed for you. What is Jesus, the righteous son of the almighty God, doing this very moment? He is seated at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for the saints of God. Church, can I tell you, Jesus is at the Father's right hand making intercession for you tonight, just as he did Peter. You have all these situations that comes your way you don't know what to say you don't know what to pray number one remember I don't know of anybody I'd rather have praying for me than the son of God himself he's praying for you but understand he's also waiting for you to pray and call upon him why because as we heard this morning ye have not because ye ask not I was sitting there in, in, in amazement this morning as Pastor Stadium was going over some of that because I was sharing with my wife that very thing last night. Ask, seek, and knock. You take that, that acronym ASK. You can't have any of that without asking. You gotta first of all go and ask, Father, give me that that I need. The power and the anointing of the Holy Ghost. God, give me that that I need. The initial evidence of speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gives the utterance. Uh, I've had people in the past tell me, Pastor, I, I'm so concerned that it'll just be me. Go ahead. He puts the words in your head. The spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. Put those lips and those tongues to action and say what he's telling you to say. Yes, at some, at some point, it might sound like baby language. It might sound like to you, goo goo gaga, but you just let that anointing of the Holy Ghost flow. And the next thing you know, you'll be allowing the Holy Spirit to flow through you, and you'll see, you'll see signs, miracles, and wonders. Now, does that mean the Holy Ghost is going to give up, or the devil's going to give up? I'm afraid not. He is going to be out after you. You see, he was out after the very son of God himself. Has, has the devil ever come to you and say, if you're a child of God, why are you suffering this? He came to Jesus, if you be the son of God, why are you so hungry? Command these stones to be made into bread. Do you understand how simple and easy it would have been for Jesus to go ahead and, and just say, oh, I'll show you, devil, Stones be made bread. But Jesus was being obedient to his father. And the, the devil, Lucifer, slew foot, if you're the son of God. There was no doubt about it. He comes to you if you're a child of God. Can I tell you, if you're saved, your name's in the Lamb's book of life, your sins are washed by the blood of Jesus Christ, there is no doubt about it, you're saved. Do you feel saved all the time? Sometimes you wake up and you just feel like the world is against you. And the devil will tell you, nobody likes you. You see, he don't like you, so he don't want anybody to like you. And if he can get you convinced that nobody likes you, can I tell you something? When he tells you nobody likes you, Tell him this, it don't matter. Jesus loves me. 
This I know. For the Bible tells me so. If Jesus loves me, devil, it don't matter if nobody else does or not. But can I tell you something? More than Jesus loves you. Your mama loves you. Your daddy loves you. Your children loves you. Your neighbors love you. Well, they don't act like it. Well, there might be some out there that don't because you may be so full of the Holy Ghost that it causes conviction on their life. And so they're going to act accordingly. See, I learned a long time ago, and I, I was so glad God taught me this. I don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That person that comes at me that doesn't like me, I, I, I came into this revelation when I first started pastoring. Everybody didn't like me, Pastor. Go figure. Everybody didn't like me. I, who, could you believe that? But I got over it because I didn't wrestle against flesh and blood. It wasn't that person that was being so mean to me. It was the adversary, the devil, pushing them. Now, if you can get a hold of that, you can look at them and smile and say, I love you. I can overlook your stupidity. I can overlook your ignorance because you're just being used as a tool of Satan. And I'm going to pray for you. Oh, that'll really make their day. But if you, can, if you can do that, so much more joy will come into your life because it's not them that so much hates you, but the adversary, the devil, and if he can use them, because you see, you can't see him standing there sticking his tongue out at you, but you can see them when they make faces at you. When, 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 when they uh, say mean things, you can hear them. But see, a lot of times the adversary, you, you really don't recognize that it's him, but it is. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. You see, we sing this song, this world is not my home, I'm just the traveling through. We, we're, we're in his domain. He was cast down here but there's coming a day when we're going to leave this place. And you see, your prayers goes through his domain. He's the prince, the power of the air. you got to pray through. The, the old timers had it. We've got to pray through. We'll come down here and we'll pray about a 20-second prayer and wonder why God didn't hear us. What's about you, God? You call somebody up on the phone if they haven't answered by the third time, you hang up. What in the world are they not answering my call for? We are so impatient. But the word of God says, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as the eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Teach me, Lord. Teach me, Lord, to wait. I'm so glad what Pastor Statham was preaching this morning. I just, I, I can't get over it, Pastor. I mean, that was just wonderful. I started in 1996. The Lord laid it upon my heart to have prayer meeting on Monday nights. When I was a little kid, we had prayer meeting on Monday nights. I remembered that. See, back when, when I was coming up, the men prayed on this side of the church and the women prayed on this side of the church. And if a man went over here to pray, he was directed to this side. Am I right? Some of you old folks can understand. Well, some of you folks that's not as young as the rest of them. And they had prayer meeting on Monday nights. So in 1996, I believe it was in August, the Lord started dealing with me about it. So I said, okay, we're going to have prayer meeting on Monday nights at 7 o'clock. And from that day to the last week that I pastored, every time Monday night rolled around, 
we had prayer meeting. Now, as Pastor Statham said this morning, there's lots of times I was there by myself. The largest crowd I ever had on a Monday night prayer meeting, I think we had 22. And we had 22 that night because immediately following prayer meeting, we was having a New Year's Eve party. And food was going to be served. That's why all them preachers got that Dunlap disease. Their belly done lapped over their belt. So, prayer. And I saw a change take place. Like I said, sometimes there's only one. But for the most part, there was at least three, maybe four. Every Monday night, praying. And we'd pray for an hour. Well, preacher, I can't pray for no hour. Have you ever started praying and not worried about the time and realize a couple hours have passed? You see, you can take that simple little prayer that Jesus gave the disciples, the model prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You can take it and break it down. I believe it was one, one pastor, Dr. Larry Lee, broke it down into a prayer outline. Phenomenal. Phenomenal outline. And, and that the Lord's prayer is praying for our communities, praying for our cities, our families, ourselves. And as we pray those prayers... It, 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 I, I know several years ago, the Church of God had uh, oh solemn assembly, and uh, I was I was district district overseer in uh, in Columbia, and they sent me down to Lawrenceburg as a as a regional prayer meeting that night, and uh, and I was to have them praying for an hour, and every five minutes I would stand up and tell them something else to pray for, and they would pray for that five minutes over that whatever that particular outline thing was and do you know that within an hour that there wasn't a person in that building that didn't I you know there'd be times I'd get up to go to get the mic and tell them I didn't see one soul looking around all you heard was the hundreds that were there praying and seeking God can I tell you when we finally get down to not worrying about that devil that's loose and start concerning ourselves with the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost and pleasing them we are going to be able to have some breakthroughs we're going to see victories in our lives we're going to see miracles and it all goes back to what Pastor Statham said and I don't mean to keep going back to him but what he said this morning in prayer when we pray, what did the scripture say? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves. You see, a lot of times we go, I'm so full of the Holy Ghost, I don't need to pray. I got so much of God, I walk down the street and people fall out. Maybe you need to change your deodorant. We're so full of ourselves. I'm church of God. I mean, Pastor Statham hit it right this morning. I've, I've been to, to ministers' retreats. I've been to ministers' meetings. And I've stood around and said, I must not be called. My belly don't stick out like that. We concern ourselves with so much. We need to concern ourselves with, with getting close to God, being full of the Holy Ghost and power. We, we, we concern ourselves so much. Have I got enough money in my pocket to get what I need, the luxuries, the lusts, the, the things of this life? But God, how much have I got of you in me? God, give more of you, more of you, more of you. God, take away the stuff of this world. What did Jesus say? What does it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his soul? I don't know who the richest man in the world is right now, but I just about guarantee he's not saved. Maybe. I don't know. I'm not his judge. But if we concern ourselves with so much of getting and gathering, you see, people say, as I heard the old saying, you probably heard it too, I get all I can, I can all I get, and sit on a can. Why? Because we're afraid somebody else is going to get it. But I had an old preacher one time come and hold a revival for me, and he said this. He says, we are not to be a bucket. We're to be a funnel. He says, we so concern ourselves with filling our bucket. He says, but you notice something. A funnel never gets full, but it continually fills 
Mm. Now that's deep. A funnel never gets full, but it continually fills. If you and I can become that funnel, Father, the power of the Holy Ghost coming through me. If we could get, if we could get that, Pastor, we'll have to build. We'd have to build. Why? Because if we can get to be that funnel and we can start filling. What happened? What happened to the to the little woman, the widow who, who was running out of oil? And the prophet told her, take your cruise of oil, go and gather every empty pot you can find. And take what you have and pour into it. They looked until every empty vessel they could find was filled. And then the oil stopped. Well, what does that have to do with anything? It has a whole lot to do with everything. How many empty vessels do you know? I'm talking about lost people. That you can take what little bit of oil you have. But I don't have very much. That little woman was about to run out. But yet she filled every empty vessel in her neighborhood. And then they took the oil and sold it. And paid the bills. Can I tell you, if you will take what little bit you have, God's going to add to it. If you start filling vessels, if you start filling empty vessels, if you start, well, preacher, how can I do it? I'm glad you asked. You start telling people about Jesus. No, you don't have to walk around with a family Bible under your arm. Whenever they start saying, is it that you're so happy all the time? Tell them. Because I've got Jesus in my heart. I have Jesus in my soul. My little girl over just a little bit ago, she, <laughs> she got my tie little old pastor, and she says, what's this? I said, that's my tithes and offering. What's in it? I said, money. She stuck it back in my pocket. She says, you need to keep that. You need it. <laughs> I said, but well, I'm going to give it to Jesus. She says, Jesus has money. I said, but Jesus is going to take this and win souls and save people. She grins. She says, you have Jesus in your heart. I have Jesus in my heart. You see, we've got to come like that little child's faith. That's what the scripture says. And understand, yes, I have Jesus in my heart, and I want to put it in your heart. And your heart, and your heart, and whose ever heart I come in contact with. I work with people that, oh Lord, they're some of the meanest people in this world, I do believe. But I've seen a change in them around me. Why? It's because as we heard this morning, they see the difference. Oh, I don't walk around and say, hey, I'm church of God, you don't talk like that in front of me. They rarely cuss around me now. I didn't tell them don't cuss. I didn't tell them don't do this and don't do that. I just live my life. Used to sing this little song that said, Jesus, be Jesus in me. No longer me, but thee. Lord, I want my life to change somebody else's. You see, I don't always have a microphone in my hand preaching the gospel. But my life every day preaches the gospel. Just like your life every day preaches the gospel. That's why there's a devil loose and he's out to devour you. If he can stop you from living for Jesus, he's tickled to death. But you know what? I believe your mind's made up. I'll not turn around. Why? I'm a soldier in the army of God. We used to sing that song. I'm a soldier in the army and I'm marching claiming victory. I will not give up. I will not turn around. I'm a soldier marching heaven down. Aren't you glad that like Simon Peter, Jesus prayed for you. 
Notice what he said. I have prayed for thee that thy faith faileth not. And when thou art converted, he was talking to a disciple. Now hold on to your theological wig. A disciple, a follower of Christ. Jesus says when you are converted. What does that mean, Jesus? That means he knew that Peter was about to backslide. Well, I don't believe that, preacher. Once you're saved, you're always saved. You tell that somebody that believes it. I don't. If it was true, why then would the word of God, I would, dear children, that you sin not. But if you do, you have an advocate with the Father, which is what? Jesus Christ the righteous. Yes, Christians mess up. But aren't you glad the love of the Father, the grace of God, the mercy of the blood, Jesus can come in and wash away my sin. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood. You can't give an offering big enough. You can't dance hard enough. You can't shout loud enough. But when you kneel down and humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and you confess your sin, but Simon Peter, when you have converted, when you have been converted, strengthen thy brethren. What happened? Jesus was taken in the garden. Peter, whom had said, I will never deny you. Jesus said, yeah, before the rooster crows, three times you will. Oh, no. How many times have you and I said, Lord, I'll never fail you, but yet we did. Three times Peter denied he knew Christ. On the third time, he thought, I'll just make it so, so clear, and he cursed, I don't know the man. About that time, the rooster crowed. According to Scripture, somehow Peter's eyes and Jesus' eyes met. Can you imagine what Peter felt at that instant? He was right. Have you ever known Jesus to be wrong? Scripture says that Peter went out and wept bitterly. What does that mean? He repented. He repented from his heart. He humbled himself, turned from his wicked way, and called upon the name of the Lord. And what happened? God forgave him for denying his son. And then about 53 days later, or a little bit longer than that, down the road, Peter stands up on the day of Pentecost and strengthened the brethren. These are not drunk as you suppose, 120 initially filled with the Holy Ghost and fire. Peter stand up, they're not drunk as you suppose, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel in the last day saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. Oh, and upon your daughters and your handmaids, I will in those days pour out my spirit. Can I tell you, Peter received his forgiveness. If you've sinned against God, don't let the devil tell you you've gone too far. You've come too late to tell me that. You haven't come too far. But Jesus said, when you are converted, Satan wants to devour you. Satan wants to sift you like wheat, but I'm praying for you. Why? Because Jesus knew what was coming down the road. Can I tell you, Jesus knows the end before it begins. You've come too late to tell me God don't forgive. You've come too late to tell me God don't see the need. Well, why, preacher, am I going through what I'm going through? I don't know. 
Well, why does God not answer my prayer? Pastor Statham answered that very clearly this morning. What are we going to do? There's a devil loose. I preached this message one time and a guy come to me every church and says, Preacher, sounds to me like we need to be lion tamers. I said, that may be, but how are you going to tame the devil? He's been a devil a whole lot longer than you've been a lion tamer. I told folks one time, I said, he's a good devil. I got some bewildered looks. What are you talking about? I said, he's very good at what he does. Are we a good Christian? Christian. 